So yeah, hello all. Uh, on the occasion of International Astronomy Day, today we are starting off a new talk series on the theme Astronomical Paradoxes. And today to inaugurate this series, as well as to give an overview of what the International Astronomy Day is, we have Dr. Isharaya Chakali from the Physics Department here with us. So sir, if you could start. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for this opportunity uh, uh, to, you know, talk about uh, International Astronomical Day. Um, so I have prepared a few slides and uh, I think which are uh, entirely random. But I, I start with uh, some brief uh, background about uh, International Astronomical Day and some glimpses about the astronomy in general. Okay, shall I uh, share the screen? <coughs> Please go ahead, yeah. Okay. So my screen is visible, right? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, okay. So, yeah, as I said, um, so I, I, I have prepared a very random, you know, slides and I just try to give some glimpses and, and uh, try to introduce uh, some astronomical aspect and uh, yeah so i start with this slide um, astronomical day um, so this main uh, key aim uh, of this day is to you know bring astronomy uh, to the uh, people so uh, this event is uh, being celebrated uh, twice every year uh, once in spring and once in fall so that was actually a 9th October uh, 2021, uh, but we are celebrating today. Um, and I think uh, this is not too much bad. So the main purpose is to, uh, you know, um, uh, for the professional astronomers and amateur astronomers to share their uh, basic knowledge and their experience and interest for astronomy uh, with the public. And eventually to increase the you know awareness uh, about the astronomy in general and about universe in particular so humans are always quest for uh, you know um, the the nearby uh, nature especially the celestial objects uh, which is actually time uh, immemorial that's how the knowledge has actually been propagated uh, uh, from one generation to the another uh, generation so we actually have to, you know, um, um, uh, inherit the knowledge uh, from one generation to the another generations. Uh, and brief history is that initially uh, this astronomical uh, day has been started in US. Uh, later, it is uh, actually propagated into other countries. Um, so it is uh, started in 1970s uh, by Doug Berger. Uh, who was the uh, president of Astronomical Association in Northern uh, California. And uh, his intention was uh, to set up uh, small scale telescopes for the uh, purpose of public to make space accessible. And uh, they can explore, come and visit the uh, observatories and then view at the night sky and then view at the various uh, you know, planets and constellations or nearby star forming regions also. And eventually, they can actually enhance their interest and learn uh, something about astronomy. So, um, so there is a, a, a general distinction uh, 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 between astronomy and astrophysics. So, basic astronomy is the, uh, which is actually the oldest uh, sciences in human history. And uh, so, astronomy is, a, is also a science that studies uh, celestial objects. Uh, here, celestial objects is everything beyond our Earth atmosphere. Okay, so um, so uh, which includes uh, uh, various planets, sun, other stars, interstellar medium, galaxies, and uh, cluster of galaxies, and etc. Okay, and uh, also it studies about various phenomena uh, actually happening in the uh, universe. Whereas the astrophysics is, uh, is, is uh, purely a branch of astronomy, but mainly concerned about the uh, uh, key physical processes 
which are associated with uh, uh, various celestial bodies and also uh, 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 various processes happening in the space between the uh, in the celestial objects and uh, uh, especially um, it's concerned about the phys physical phenomena of stars uh, planets galaxies and their formation evolution and ultimately their future so astrophysics can actually provide a, a, a laboratory where one can one can apply and test various physical laws and theories at extreme physical conditions so this extreme physical conditions cannot be produced or seen in general in the uh, actual uh, laboratories so uh, when it comes to the temperatures temperatures are are, are huge uh, uh huge uh, uh, uh ranges and and pressures also uh, scales uh spatial scales and also densities so and all these parameters physical parameters uh, cannot be attainable on earth and uh, as such astrophysics is a purely observational science based on uh, observations we can actually detect light and then we analyze the light and we can study various uh, physical processes happening uh, in these celestial objects and uh, as i told um, these uh, cannot be studied in actual uh, laboratories inside our uh, our uh, you know labs and astronomy astrophysics can also lead to the development of uh, mathematics and other branches of physics for example starting from the babylon uh, time uh, which, which are actually ancient times um, so when they search uh, about the you know solution uh, solutions to the astronomical problems they required new ways of mathematics and they, they uh, this led to the development of geometry and trigonometry and thousand years later uh, newton's observations about the planetary motions and then positions actually led to the uh, you know development of mechanics uh, laws of motion and eventually the development of calculus and 300 uh, 300 years later einstein's study about the universe actually uh, gives rise to the general theory of relativity and Eddings, uh, Eddingson's concept uh, about nuclear fusion can actually explain the uh, energy source in stars. And nowadays, uh, uh, a relativistic, uh, relativistic uh, physicist, cosmologist, and high energy physicist are testing their theories and uh, taking the universe uh, uh, by taking the universe as a whole, uh, as universe as a whole as a laboratory. And uh, so I have mentioned about the various physical conditions in the celestial bo bodies, right? When you look at the temperatures, you can see that uh, the uh, the temperature at the core of the, the stars will be millions of degree Kelvin. And then gravitational pressure is the order of 250 million times of the gravity uh, on Earth. You can see the extremity of these physical conditions. And then density at uh, the, the center of the neutron stars can be trillions of uh, uh, grams per centimeter cube. Whereas in the general interstellar medium, it is uh, something like 10 to the power of minus 24 trillion to trillionth part of uh, uh, grams per centimeter uh, cube. And mass of the stars ranges from 0 0.1 to 100 solar mass. And mass of the galaxies, you can see 10 to the power of 12 to 10 to the power of 13. Uh, uh, solar mass. So you can see if average, uh, ma if you assume a uh, average mass of uh, a star, uh, something like one solar mass, and you can see like uh, such kind of stars uh, are, are very numerous, something like 10 to the proper 12, 1 trillion to tens, uh, tens of trillion uh, uh, stars are there in one galaxy. You can see one gal uh, galaxy actually can, can, can uh, follow something like a spiral like structures. And every uh, galaxy can host a black hole at the center. And you can see the spatial scale, which is nothing but like 60,000 light years, you know? So you cannot imagine like, uh, so this is how like, if, if, if we can travel with the light velocity, it would take like 60,000 years to cross from, uh, to reach from one point to the another point of the, the galaxy. So this is the, um, uh, this is the color composite image of the uh, uh, Wildful Galaxy, or M51, which is something like analogous to our Milky Way Galaxy, uh, which is a combined image uh, from optical uh, telescope and then Hubble Space Telescope, which is a space telescope, which has very high resolution. So from ground-based telescopes, we cannot see uh, very clear uh, features. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, star formation is active along these spiral arms. Um, and um, 
and if you see that uh, so the galaxies in the in the universe uh, are also very numerous uh, which actually ranges uh, from 10 to the power of 12 to 10 to the power of 13 galaxies so it's very huge if you see the 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 spatial scales the difference between the spatial scales of the planets and sun you can see that the earth is some, somewhere here is is very small and uh, we can actually fit like 1.3 million earth into one sun and if you compare our sun with respect to another very large uh, uh, stars for example with legacy you can see the size comparison uh, again you can fit uh, 1.3 or even more uh, number of uh, suns into uh, this beta legacy which is a red, red giant star and uh, on the passes of uh, this cassini uh, space telescope um, so when it reaches the saturn you can see the uh, the saturn's ring here so with the uh, wide wide angle camera of cassini it took the image of uh, you know our earth and and also moon so because of the low resolution wide field you can see that both moon and earth can be seen as a, a one dot a pale dot so this is actually the you know the comparison between the uh, uh the the various uh, uh, you know spatial scales between the various objects um and if you see if you locate uh, a entire solar system uh, in the milky way galaxy so this is actually artistic rendition of our milky way galaxy uh, being in our milky way we cannot actually take uh, uh, the image of our, our own galaxy okay this is the artistic rendition and if we if we locate ourselves our entire solar system into a, a galaxy so we are located somewhere here which is uh, something like 8 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy uh, you can see that uh, various spiral arms are which are actually pointing towards the uh, black hole so and because our astronomical observations are actually uh, always uh, deals with the you know photons so light right so we detect the light from the star and then we analyze it and then study so always our atmosphere is uh, is being very interesting which plays an important role in detecting the uh, lights from the distant stars okay so there will be a huge uh, empty space between the star and our at the atmosphere and uh, when the light reaches our at the atmosphere it will actually undergo attenuation because of scattering or absorption and uh, since the different layers of our atmosphere moves with the different uh, velocities so light get actually scattered uh, it will be you know um, deviated from its original path so as a result of this process instead of point source we'll get uh, something like a point spread uh, like uh, you know profile and um, so, and also uh, in order to mitigate the effect of earth atmosphere we can actually you know uh, launch the space uh, space uh, telescopes and then uh, being uh, uh, telescopes in the space they can be free from the atmosphere so as a result of this one you know if you don't have any atmosphere we will get a very sharp uh, images you know so uh, so if you compare the uh, resolution at different aspects for example our human eye can have a resolution of a uh, few tens of arc seconds and then galileo uh, with 5 cm have uh, something like a 10 to you know 5 arc second resolution and herschel is a space based uh, telescope which which is actually have very good resolution about 1 arc second arc second and the hubble space telescope is also 2.4 meter uh, space based telescope which actually have very good resolution of the order of 0.1 arc second so so in order to understand what is resolution so for example i i showed here the uh, the combined image of uh, uh, of our, our earth and the moon right so uh, if we have a better res resolution we can actually distinguish between moon and earth so so because of poor resolution we cannot uh, separate uh, these two objects uh, separately okay and <coughs> this is the, one of the beautiful uh, image taken by hubble so this hubble actually observed this uh, very small region for 10 uh, years and then they clubbed various uh, you know these images together and then they could see uh, the the uh, very interesting uh, uh, image containing uh, millions of uh, you know uh, galaxies so in this image each point is a galaxy 
there are i think there are very few stars this could be a star but i think there are every uh, single point is a uh, galaxy you can see that you know us is is not simply our galaxy not simply our solar system so there is a much beyond that and uh, if you look at the cosmology big bang theory uh, the universe actually started before uh, something like 13.8 billion years and then from that onwards it is actually been expanding and forming uh, the structures so the current uh, era current uh, that time in this current time you can see all the galaxies our milky way galaxy uh, nearby galaxies actually uh, follow something like a spiral like structures something like this but before that the universe is entirely different and then recently uh, the hubble space telescope have found a very oldest and uh, furthest galaxy uh, which is located in the deep field you can see this is the oldest galaxy uh, which is uh, i think very very uh, kind of very old but in comparison to the big bang uh, which is something like 0.4 billion years uh, uh, distant from the big bang in order to observe the earliest universe we need to actually have biggest telescope and uh, better resolution okay um and and uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a group of galaxies you can see and if you even see much beyond that the entire universe actually uh, you know looks like a web which is actually called as a cosmic web which is actually composed of massive filaments of galaxies separated by giant voids so there is a, a empty space is called a void and formed in the first few hundred thousand years after the big bang so you can see that this is the actually cosmic web so in order to see these structures we need to really have very big telescopes and you know uh, so and and given all these uh, inferences we i want to highlight that uh, we may not be alone in the universe like you know we uh, we are humans and we are living on earth and we are actually you know uh, 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 living very close to sun type star which is a g type and uh, a relatively cooler stars cooler star and which is at, at the main sequence and uh, since i told there are 10 to the power of 12 stars in our galaxy if you assume even uh, half of the stars could be like our uh, sun and if you if every star um, uh, if it every star contains or host the planets and there is a much high probability that uh, human or intelligent life uh, will be there uh, in the other uh, universe around other stars okay so we may, we may not be alone in the universe if we see the uh, the physical conditions for for uh, the habitable zone uh, you see the the structure of our sun and then planets around our solar system our earth is located somewhere here some something like you know after uh, venus and before uh, mars um, so life only exists on earth but not on the other planets you can see the the kind of uh, the green zone which is the habitable zone so in the venus it's too hot because it's very close to sun and mars is also very far and it's very cold okay on earth only it's warm and and actually life can exist on the earth because of the favorable uh, you know physical conditions and when it comes to the uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, 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 recent uh, uh, earth like uh, planet called trappist 1 and if you see the physical uh, if you compare the physical scale between our solar system and the another another sun like uh, system uh, so this trappist is actually uh, located very close to the star but this can actually host uh, uh, life because uh, the star which is hosting this uh, planet is uh, actually even colder than our sun okay so if we compare uh, the the habitable zone Uh, if you plot uh, 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 the you know on axis if you plot starlight on planet relative to the sunlight on earth and versus temperature our earth is actually following here you know which is actually in the habitable zone and uh, venus uh, is also very venus is very close to the sun and, and it, it actually having the higher amount of radiation from the sun and if you compare uh, our, uh, the physical conditions on mars which is very far because the mars actually can have very small amount of sun radiation uh, you can see something like uh, around 30 to 40% of uh, solar radiation and uh, which is very cold 
and that's why it cannot actually host the live and uh, there are many uh, uh, exo, exo uh, uh, solar planets and uh, some of may actually host the life so these are very uh, kind of very few planets which are actually lying, lying very close to our our sun so there are many many stars something like 10 to the power of 12 and there could be many many planets and there could be intelligent life so this famous scientist uh, uh, called dr frank drake uh, he tried to quantify the you know intelligent life uh, which can actually have the skills of communication so this he gave a famous relation which is a function of various parameters so uh, this is n is actually a number of civilizations civilizations which could communicate us uh, so um, uh, which is a function of you know number of uh, 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 which is actually a function of mean rate of star formation okay this r star is the star formation rate and then f uh, p is the fraction of stars that can have planets and the n e is the mean number of planets that can actually support life and f l is the fraction of uh, planets that actually support uh, life and then f y is the fraction of planets with life where life actually develops into intelligence life okay life may be there but we need to have the intelligent life right like us human beings and then fc is actually a fraction of intelligent civilizations that develop communications we also actually started communication but we couldn't uh, uh, receive any uh, you know extra terrestrial uh, signal and then l is actually the mean length of the time that civilizations can communicate okay if they have less lifetimes uh, life uh, lifespan they cannot communicate right so this is actually a function of various parameters and then if you give various parameters i think there could be something like if you give a very small uh, the, the parameters can actually some range if you input the smallest uh, uh, ranges of the values then there could be you know a uh, minimum 20 uh, civil, uh, intelligence uh, civilizations uh, could be possible and then if you uh, you know substitute the higher uh, uh, fraction of values there could be you know 1000 to you know uh, 100 millions of uh, intelligent lives in our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, this is up to some inferences about the astronomy. And uh, I just want to give some highlight on the, uh, you know, observatories in our India. And there are various observatories in India, in Southern India, uh, which are mainly hosted by, uh, operated by Indian Institute of Astrophysics, which is in, in located in Bangalore, uh, which runs, uh, runs actually uh, four observatories, uh, mainly Indian Astronomical Observatory, which is actually uh, uh, there in the, in the Handley, uh, in the Himalayan ranges. And then there is a radio telescope called uh, uh, Gauri Bidnur Radio Observatory. And there is an optical observatory called Vainbapu Observatory. And then there are two uh, solar telescopes. In One is in Wuti and then another one is in Kodaikanal. And Ayuka also have some radio telescopes uh, called giant meter radio telescopes. And there is in uh, there is few observatories in the uh, physical research laboratory. Um, so uh, uh, it actually operates one solar observatory in Udaipur and then optical and uh, near infrared observatory in, in, in Mount Abu. And these are various pictures uh, to increase the keen about uh, astronomy. Uh, so this, uh, this 2.3 meter telescope is in Kavluru, which is very close to us, Tirupati, okay? uh, which, is in, which is in the Tamil Nadu. And 2 meter uh, uh, Himalayan Chandra telescope, HCT, is in the Himalayas uh, in Handley. And two meter uh, Ayuka Giravali telescope is there uh, in Giravali, uh, operated by Ayuka. And there is a 1.2 meter telescope in uh, Mount Abu, operated by Physical uh, Research Laboratory. And uh, since I came from uh, Aries Nainital, I just would like to highlight various uh, telescopes in Nainital. This is very beautiful uh, 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 image of the uh, Nainital Observatory, Aries. You can see one meter dome here. So most of my life, seven years, was actually spent, uh, uh, you know, in this observatory. And mainly, I took observations from this telescope, one meter telescope. And there is a various telescopes that has been installed in Devastal, which are operated by Aries. Uh, and uh, Aries is actually operating mainly 3.6 meter uh, uh, Devastal optical telescope, which is the biggest telescope in, in, in India. And we also have uh, actually part of a 30 meter telescope, and it's very huge. You can see this telescope is planned to install in in, uh, in summit of Mauna Kea. So Mauna Kea is one of the cleanest uh, astronomical observatory, which is, uh, you can see that various domes are, are corresponding to you know telescopes at various wavelengths. I have been there uh, uh, twice uh, to conduct some observations. Um, so, and I'd like to uh, stop here uh, by highlighting that we are actually made of uh, 
of stardust uh, since um, you know planets actually form uh, from from so solar system debris and sun actually form from multiple clouds and again this multiple clouds actually form from interstellar medium and stars evolve uh, goes under various evolutionary stages and then eventually they die and whatever the material uh, is there in the stars will mix up with the interstellar medium so eventually again the stars will form from the interstellar medium so we are actually made up of stardust and uh, so uh, i think uh, uh, this is the the final slide um, so we must preserve earth uh, because uh, this is our home uh, in the universe okay because of the increase in the pollution uh, effects by humans many other animals and planets is actually being uh, polluted and then slowly our you know uh, the the human race will also extinct it so we need to actually reduce the pollution and then save our earth so i stop here and uh, you know if you have any uh, questions or uh, queries then i'll happy to take thank you yeah i think i think i took longer than uh, what i was actually planning for so excuse me sir yeah uh, arjit yes yeah sir i just had a small doubt like uh, i always wondered that how these um, estimations are made that uh, there are around uh, this much uh, stars in the whole universe or like these kind of uh, yeah yeah so the the number right which over the stars yeah. and galaxies is actually based on the observations only so yeah so we know the sun right uh, only one star and then we know the flux from what is the flux which is actually coming from our sun and then by observing the entire galaxy as a one point we can actually estimate the uh, the corresponding number of uh, stars in exist in the galaxy it's just a scaled version yeah okay sir thank you Are there any further questions from anyone? Sir, uh, the color of the star depends on which may, which thing. Hi, Subhadeep. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Yeah, the color of the star depends on the temperature. So the, I think you studied the the Wien's law, right? Lambda m t is equal to constant. So uh, the lambda m you can actually you can say is as the color, and the t is the temperature. So the color is inversely proportional to temperature. So higher the temperature, uh, lower the wavelength. So the bluer the wavelength. So for example, the OB type stars with uh, ten uh, ten uh, kind of greater than 10,000 Kelvin temperature, generally uh, look like a blue, very bluish. And then the stars with the low temperature actually looks like red. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, sir, uh, how do we measure the weight of our galaxy? Weight of our galaxy. Yeah, as yes. I said, so we know the mass of our sun, right? We know the mass of our sun, and then uh, by observing the flux generally, we can actually quantify what is the uh, entire mass of the galaxy. So uh, the main source of uh, any analysis is the light, right? So, yeah, that's how we actually measure the uh, mass of any celestial object. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, and 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 also based on the rotational curve, if we go much deeper. Um, so we can actually, uh, if we um, uh, plot the radial distance versus velocity, so the uh, because of the conservation of uh, momentum, uh, closer the objects, it, they rotate faster, and further the objects, they rotate uh, uh, slower, right? Even our planets, right? So the Mercury can rotate faster because it's very close, in order to conserve the angular momentum, it has to rotate faster, right? So, yes. so based on that also, um, uh, we can actually quantify the mass. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. If there are no more questions, uh, I guess we can move forward. Sir, yeah. thank you for like a great session, providing quite a detailed overview of 
the highlights of astronomy and astrophysics in general. It was very informative to listen. So thank you from behalf of Celestic for this. I'm sure yeah, all yeah. the audience feel the same. So um, today, as I said before, we'll be starting off the astronomical paradoxes series. And uh, so today we have our first speaker here, Science and Mandel, who will be speaking on the topic of uh, black hole information paradox. And yeah, I hand it over to you, Science and continue. Hi, everybody. Hello. Am I audible? That was just to ensure. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. Yes, audible. Okay, okay, okay. So can I share my screen? Yeah, yes, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. So is my screen visible? Yeah, Hello? yes, yes, I am done. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. So at first I would like to know that um, it this was a very, very wonderful, significant and informative uh, talk from the Israel, sir. And I really miss the opportunity to hear this from in person. Uh, because we are all in lockdown, especially I say lockdown because for the 19 and 20 batch, we are working from home. So I hope I can listen some more in informative talk from the sir very soon. So now I think we can start. So I am Santan Mandal from IZ Tripathi BSMS 2020 West, currently at the second year of my course. So today my topic is black hole information paradox. You can see the name here. And it's just not only a topic, it's just a, like a, a mystery to the physicist that Hello. Yes, yes, it's fine. Okay, okay, thank you. So it's not just only a topic, it's just a mystery, it's just a fun, it's just a puzzle that make the physicist thoughts for think for the decades. And so it's it, I am I am just like a dust in the realm of this uh, area of uh, astrophysics, but got some courage to uh, and you got some courage to utilize this opportunity. Uh, to explore. So just as an explorer in the physics, I, I just try to elaborate what I get my knowledge in this particular topic. So yes, I am very much confused and very much afraid just before the talk because I don't, because this is such a topic that make the physicist, the brilliant minds of the world think for the decades. And now I am very far apart of object. So I don't know to how much experience extent I can convince my points to you and I don't also don't know how much information I can share to you but it's all of uh, have a fun of science so let's uh, begin so just the name suggests black hole information paradox I would first uh, like to have some insight what is paradox okay so here is a definition a paradox is a statement that apparently contradicts itself and yet might be true what does this essentially mean but in, in which portion it is different from a law. This paradox is a thing that doesn't fall into a lap and doesn't uh, give you a very uh, clear picture and yeah, this is true. This is not like that. It is kind of a suggested idea given to you, given to everybody, given to the physics community that okay, it's an idea, you think about it. Many uh, person think about it, modify it, uh, get, let her give some suggestion and thus it grows up and finally uh, end up with some very extraordinary solution. So this is how paradox is different from uh, kind of law or some statement like things. It's kind of, but it doesn't, It at the same side, it doesn't mean that it is uh, wrong. It's not wrong. And at the same side, it doesn't mean that it, it is true. It is appeared to be true. It's like a suggested idea that you take it, you think on it, and then you realize it, what is going to be. So this is a paradox and such a famous paradox in physics is black hole information paradox that I'm gonna talk in the next few minutes. Uh, twin paradox by Albert Einstein, Schrodinger's cat paradox, Jenner's paradox, like many paradoxes are there in our physics. So I think it just, uh, it will be kind of injustice to black hole if we, if we don't give any introduction of black hole at first, rather going to the paradox itself. So, 
at first preparing this slide i thought to have uh, some int basic introduction of black hole then we'll move to the main content of our today's meet so i think the poster that is given to all of you all of us um, about this talk i think the abstract is kind uh, of give you a best introduction uh, on the black hole so black holes are basically not only the strangest but are the most powerful things in the universe what it, what it can do it can remove anything from its existence even not you but a whole star to a point size pieces you, you just imagine how a star can be big sun is just a little star in our uh, galaxy in our universe there will be much more bigger star in our universe so it can just uh, ripping a whole star into a point size piece and this is where the black hole information paradox comes that i will explain in later in in our coming slides so if you take something that is full of information and throw it into a black hole the black hole gains all the mass now it is very general that if you have a room you can put up your uh, luggage it will get its weight so the same way it also work here but what happens happens to the information that is stored inside that object so that this is the main uh, purpose of our today's talk. So black hole have some kind of dark property, not only to remove anything from its existence, but is much more scary. That is, it can also delete the information. So that we are going to explore. So let's... Sayant, can you can you make the screen uh, larger? Okay. Yeah, your screen, yeah. Uh, in, so, the, in the presentation mode sir i don't know how to make it larger so can you please uh -huh. help me okay in the bottom uh, bottom right can you can you see there is a full screen a view or if you go to the view um, in the top left uh, buttons yeah view 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 insert design uh, uh, could you, you can go to slideshow yeah slideshow yeah, yeah slideshow yes. click slideshow slideshow i cannot uh, find it uh, at the top uh, up, 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 top? yeah that panel yeah, i think uh, after click slideshow, slideshow. slideshow to the right next to animations go up next to animations yes. yeah 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 okay. uh, from beginning okay great So should I click OK? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just try it out. Oh, yeah, it works yeah. perfectly. So yeah. Go. So now coming to the history of a black hole. So am I audible? Just to ensure. Yes. Yeah, all good. Okay. So now coming to the history of a black hole. So uh, many body um, tries to introduce the history of a black hole in a different way. But I found some interesting information from a book written by Jayant Narlikar, a famous Indian astrophysicist. Uh, so I got this information is that the old, though black hole is an astrophysical object, but the oldest mention of a black hole is found not in the books of physics, but the B British history of India books. It's, it's in the history book, you know. So what is that? The Nawab Sirajuddullah, who was the ruler of the Bengal in Eastern India, marched in Kolkata in the summer of the year 1757. And then he's uh, then with the British East India Company, he settled a feud with the British India Company. The small garrison stationed at Fort William in Kolkata was hardly a match for the Nawab's army of 50,000. So in the four day battle that enused the East India Company lost many lives. Okay, so that is what is written here. So in the year 1757, Nawab Sirajuddullah, whose army had lost thousands of lives in the battle, ordered the uh, survivors to be imprisoned in what came to be known as the black hole. And he ordered to be imprisoned the survivors in a room that was 18 feet by 14 feet in, uh, in dimension. And there was 146 survivors that are imprisoned in that room. And the room had only two windows. So just think the situation, how cruel it, it was. So during the 10 hours of imprisonment, 123 prisoners died. So this Macbeth incident in the history, now known as the Black Hole of Kolkata. So though it doesn't have some astrophysical significance, but I just uh, talking about the coining of the term. 
so it also has because the room has very small and also have only just two windows it is kind of dark so that is quite uh, have some similarity with the black hole so that's it now coming to the main scientific uh, view of the black hole the first it was thought about john michael and the uh, 1783 he though that time it was totally of the newtonian area and so he just only had the newton's uh, uh, law of gravitation so according to that law he just uh, thought of some dark star that has some property from where light cannot escape but that time it was uh, slightly debatable because many people don't accept the idea but later later when einstein came into the picture i think there is no need to introduce this person it is uh, from uh, a child to a uh, adult person everybody know him so after his discovery of the theory of relativity the existence of black hole is become more prominent okay so now let's start our discussion with the general theory of relativity so because uh, the concept of black hole essentially comes uh, comes from this uh, general theory of relativity so i think it's better to start with here so this what does this general theory of relativity says the basic idea is that mass curves space and time here you can see it is r and space and time you can consider space and time as a uniform clouds and if you put some heavy objects on a close it will essentially bend down to some depth so that is that mass curves the space time here on the screen uh, this is a fabric of space time and here a very large mass like the earth is uh, on the space time that curving it all down and now you see uh, when it, it it is about the black hole to, you can see how largely it can uh, turn uh, curve down the space time so what happens now a black hole concentrates so much mass into a so tiny amount of space the points in space that is curves the space time into a larger amount even light cannot escape from its region so next one okay so here it is written that the black hole appears when an extraordinary amount of matter is concentrated in a tiny space light cannot escape from it now this means this this simple statement but this essentially led to the very fundamental concept of the physics is that this means that the, there is nothing that can travel faster than the light this simple statement that is appearing currently on the screen this simple statement can lead us to that fundamental theory of physics that nothing can travel faster than the light now what we can see is that Uh, we say that, that not everything that light uh, touches in your that touches is your future that means that nothing travels faster than light surely uh, surely we, we, that li even light can nothing any object in the universe cannot travel faster than the light so that is why you and me every human being cannot surely uh, travel um, cannot travel faster than the light so anywhere we can go or anything we can do that is obviously have to be done within this realm of this region this is this figure is called called the light cone this is the future light cone this is the uh, first light cone so anything anywhere you go anything you do you have to be confined in this region precisely it's a cone you can imagine yourself sitting as the tip this is the current event at you are in your uh, home watching this meet and everything inside this cone everything inside this cone represents the space where light can travel to light cannot travel let me also light cannot travel the outside of this region so as light can travel within this region so the you now what happened to the now you keep the basic question comes what happened to the outside everything outside this cone light cannot get there and you also being traveling more slowly than the light also cannot get there either so you can never go out outside of this cone and so this cone what the cone represents this represents where the light or slower than uh, slower velocity anything the light can travel this cone represents those areas okay now with this basic intuition intuition um, in our mind this It, this peak represents the space time diagram of a black hole now in this diagram we are uh, we are imagining that time are running in the upward upward direction 
that means that a star is gradually sinking and collapsing into a point so it's getting smaller and smaller and forming a black hole the gray surface the gray surface you can hear there because it it, it is uh, quite far, but I think it's as a gray because it is white or you can think of it as a, a dark surface because I don't want to call it a dark surface because it, this is uh, event horizon essentially, which is not at all dark. So you can think of it as a gray surface. So this gray surface is as the event horizon of a black hole. So as these stars collapses further and further, taking all these masses and concentrating in this region, which is smaller and smaller, everything space time is so curved that all this huge amount of mass is concentrated to a space of zero volume. And this is what we call singularity. And now you can ask the what is singular? The singularity is not anything like a point, like a um, situation. It's just like a, it's a future. Now look at this, uh, look at this cone, which is extreme right of this uh, screen. This cone is essentially outside of the black hole. And, um, and you know, from the previous slide, you cannot go outside of this cone because light cannot get there. So now, to, uh, now uh, the, the key is gravity. The black hole is so massive. It is an enormous attraction of the gravitational force that it wraps the space time in much amount and causes this cone to be inside in the black hole. You can see here. This is outside of the cone, but it, but the black hole wraps the space time in a in a enormous way that every uh, cone is now getting inside into the black hole. Now, as you are sitting on the now, consider yourself by sitting on the tip of this cone, and everything that goes into your 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 world is now already confined into this black hole. This is already your future is now defined to the black hole. Now a black hole, now this is why everything that goes into black hole must reach the singularity and you cannot avoid this fate. Whenever you are inside this black hole, you cannot avoid your future other than singularity because singularity is your future and you always be attracted toward the singularity and this is your tomorrow. Now a black hole appears on an external extraordinary amount of matter is concentrated in a tiny space. So I got a very uh, famous example uh, in the YouTube that you can imagine the situation like a waterfall. So you can imagine yourself in the, this is a very beautiful picture. You can imagine yourself, you are swimming in this waterfall. Now, as long as you, you are swimming in this area, you will, you will, you, you cannot see the black hole. You, you are totally safety you are totally safe but but by the time the speed uh, the velocity of the water keeps increasing and but the time you you appear more closer closer to the waterfall the more how how much effort you can give there is no point of return to your safe zone you will always be attracted towards this point of no returning so this is is you can imagine as a, this is your black hole and this is the outer space and this is kind of your event horizon. So as soon as you come close to the event horizon, your future is going to be destined into the black hole because this event horizon will not let you to go outside as long as soon as you cross this event horizon. So this event horizon is the border that completely separates the black hole from the rest of the universe and we cannot access what is inside that black hole unless and until we are willing to go into the point of no return. Okay. So now, so from the, up to this slide, we, we have got a classical view of the black hole. Now, as the time goes on, we got, we started, there is a scientist developing a parallel, developing parallel branch called uh, quantum mechanics. So, you can see this what is uh, told uh, in the, uh, uh, begin, at the beginning of the quantum mechanics is that if quantum mechanics has not profoundly shocked you, you have not understood it yet. This means that quantum mechanics is no longer that straightforward like the classical mechanics. Whenever in which place quantum mechanics appears, it will essentially make the thing very weird. So 
Now at the same time, physicists de developing theory of black hole. In parallel, they were also developing another theory, quantum mechanics. So in the late 1970s, some uh, people started thinking, especially the British physicist Stephen Hawking. So what he said that, what he got that courage and he got that beautiful uh, mind of thinking that what would happen? What would happen if we apply the quantum mechanics to the theory of black hole? Because you know, science is all about doing experiments, doing fun. So let's apply. It doesn't matter what is going to be the result. So he applied for the this quantum mechanics to the theory of black hole. And what he found is really striking, really very strange. Because this result is essentially going to change the complete description of the black hole that we are used to think for our past time. What he found that, he found some spark of fire. You can say it's a quantum fire at the event horizon of the black hole. And fire means some light. So what it concludes that black holes are now no longer black. It's no longer a region of complete darkness. It, it, it has some light. So this, this um, result uh, totally changed the view of the black hole. So uh, not only that, physicists also um, physicist also um, calculate the spectrum of this fire, the color of the fire, and basically there is another problem came there. So at first we talked about the classical point of view of the black hole and essentially the general relativity. So what general relativity does is that it governs the macro scale, the very large scale of activities like the movement of planet, uh, star, etc. And but the quantum mechanics governs the world of subatomic particles, like the very small scale activities, proton, neutron, electron. So okay. So black hole is the place where general relativity and quantum mechanics meet together. But physicists found that this GT, general theory of GTR means uh, general theory of relativity. This is the abbreviation of that, and quant QM means quantum mechanics. The physicists found that these two main philosophies physics, physics doesn't play together. This is not at all well suitable together. So what can we do? Can we do? Because both are true from their perspective. Whatever they have some uh, battle among themselves, but they are true from their perspective. So now what is the alternative? What we can do? What we can search for? So is there any new alternative? Yes, science never stops. So it goes on. So the new alternative is yes, quantum gravity. That essentially finds out uh, the solution how we can uh, we can bring together the general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. So this is a famous book by Lee Semelin, the Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, and this new branch is called quantum gravity. Though this is not a fully developed branch, so I hope by the time it's got developed, we can be able to find many interesting questions from the Big Bang to the black hole information for many things. So <clears throat> now coming to the uh, next slide. So what I tell is that physicists not only uh, saw that quantum fire, but also calculate the spectrum of the fire. And they found that this particular fire, the color of the fire over the particular distribution, which is called Planck distribution. Now, here is the main key point. Here, is, this is your black hole. This is your uh, some particle escaping and going into the black hole. And this is uh, the black hole event horizon. And now this is the Hawking radiation. As Hawking this, uh, proposed this uh, radiation, uh, so it is uh, it was named after uh, Hawking. So the key point is these colors of the fire that burns uh, at the surface of the black hole. So when you include quantum effect, it didn't depend on what the black hole is made of. It only depends on the mass of the black hole. There can be uh, some bigger black holes, some smaller black hole, some medium sized black holes in this universe. But essentially, this uh, Hawking radiation doesn't depend on what the black hole is made of. It only depends on the mass of the black hole. And that is the key point. That means if you have a bigger black hole, you, you see the radiation to be glow much red. If you have a smaller black hole, you can see this uh, radiation to glow much blue. This is hotter. So, but if you have, um, like you say, let's say if you ha have some black holes of the same masses that have the same kind of the fire, there is no change. For uh, the black hole of same masses, you have the same kind of fire. Now this fire would gradually, and this fire would gradually heat up the entire black hole by the time, because when the fire is radiated from the black hole, it, it essentially decreases some masses from the black hole. 
So after some time, it will gradually eat up the total black hole. And what you are left in, you will left in only some radiation, some photon. Now you can ask, the, what is the um, unusual thing in this? Everything is all right. There is a black hole. There is some radiation. OK, it might be some have some color. Black hole is now not totally black. And gradually, it uh, totally eats up the black hole. Now everything fine. What is the unusual thing about it? And here comes the main strike to the physicist. The unusual thing is that it contradicts with the very, very fundamental law of physics, the principle of uh, reversibility. We know that all the classical laws of physics are deterministic. What does it mean? It means that in classical physics, if you know everything about a system, let's say you have a system, and if you know everything about a system at some instant of time, and you also know parallelly the equations that govern how the system changes, then you can predict the future. And not only the future, in with uh, by using the same set of equation, you can also tell everything about the past. And such system is called reversible. And this is the principle of reversibility. So this Hawking radiation strikes the main fundamental law of this physics, that is principles of reversibility. And what is the strike? That is, I told in the previous slide that the, it will only left with some radiation. And the Hawking radiation doesn't depend on the other things, parameters of the black hole. It only depends on the mass. So suppose, uh, let's say, some black hole is only made up of some stars. Like if many stars are different in, in our uh, inner universe, there are many kind of stars. And each and every star have some different properties. So the Hawking radiation is not going to tell you what kind of stars contribute to the formation of that black hole. So there is the violation of the principle of reversibility. Now, as the beginning of the talk, at the, the title of our talk, the black hole information paradox. Now we'll move to the now next slide and we're going to search what is exactly mean by information here. And nowadays, in the days of virtual world and many more internet things and stuff, information is so, so important uh, that everyone can understand. And even from the, apart from the, uh, uh, so-called internet things world in our daily life if anybody in any neighbors get to know about our personal information it is obvious it is of course that that information is not going to be lost rather it will be spread in our community the most much more higher rate so that is why information is so so important let's look what does exactly we mean information in our particular uh, topic so what is in this information? This information is nothing, uh, you can think it's but a property of arrangement of particles. Now see, imagine uh, there is a bunch of carbon atoms. You already start, uh, studied in, in chemistry. You can think, imagine some bunch of carbon atoms. And you can here see, this is a piece of coal and this is a piece of diamond. You know the uh, difference of these two material, both in terms of uh, cost, in terms of its uh, demand and everything, its structure, solidity everything you know the difference so you imagine but but the main purpose is but the main thing is that both are made up with the same building blocks that is the carbon atoms so if you let's say if you have a certain uh, arrangement of carbon atoms in this piece of coal but if you slightly defer this position to some extent um, amount you will essentially get this idea get this uh, diamond so but remember, all the building, basic building blocks are same. So what makes these two things different? That is the information. How the atoms are arranged inside the, uh, that particular object. That particular information differentiates the two objects. How these are arranged. So this is our particular information in this context. So the basic building blocks of everything in this universe are the same. So if you don't have any information, everything will be same, like simply an atom. There will be no such coal piece, there's no such uh, demand, no such you, no such you, me. Everything will be such atom. So this particular information, the arrangement of atom inside you, inside me, is going to differentiate between us. Now, according to quantum mechanics, this information is indestructible. It might change the shape, 
but it can never be lost. It is totally conserved. Like in the next slide, if you have some books, uh, this is totally, uh, I am totally against of this picture. You shouldn't burn, burn any books in any kind. Yeah, distribute to the people, but don't buy, uh, don't burn any book. Book is the ultimate uh, wealth that you have ever have in your life. So, but uh, for our sake of example, I took this picture uh, that let's say you have uh, what our biggest source of information? Obviously, the encyclopedia. So, let's say it is a big encyclopedia and you are going to burn this. So, as long after burning this, it will completely transform into the assets. So, you can say, you can in reality, you can say, okay, the book, the book is uh, completely uh, burned and the information contained in the book is completely lost. This is your physical reality, but that's not the science deal with. The science is uh, the thing you see in your eyes is not the actual world. The thing you cannot see in your eyes is much more bigger world. So here the quantum mechanics come and quantum mechanics says, no, the information is never lost. If we collect the assets very carefully, and if we analyze each and every carbon uh, atom in this axis and, and uh, analyze it properly, we can trace back to your previous stage and we can completely reconstruct the paper. That's what the quantum mechanics says. So, but what Hawking radiation suggests to us, this Hawking radiation suggests to us as that it doesn't depend on any other properties of the black hole except the masses. So as long as when the black hole is completely burnt up and it left to some photons or some radiation, we're not going to get any kind of information about the first place, uh, about the first formation of the black hole how in, by, by which the black hole is made up. So now what happened to this information? That was our questions. Is it completely lost somewhere else? Conserved anything? Now, come, now let's move forward. So whenever you do some thought experiment, this Bob and Alice, these two names are very common in uh, doing some thought experiments. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these two names, but even if you look, even if you uh, one day, if you are going to do some uh, thought experiments, you can take this name, Bob and Alice. So let me drink some water. Now our main uh, interest is what is happened to the information. Okay, so here you can see that the particles that are emitted by the black holes are entangled in a very specific way. That can be one possible uh, scenario that we can think of and Hawking radiation that essentially suggests that. So um, uh, this is a space-time diagram of a black hole and this circles, this circles um, is a black hole and this vertical axis is the uh, vertical axis is the time evolving and here black hole here black hole is uh, sitting and uh, there is no, in this picture nothing is happened actually nothing is going to happening actually so inside you see this is singularity and the event horizon defines defines the boundary of a black hole so if you see the outside if you see the outside of the event horizon uh, that goes uh, that goes vertically you can see outside the event horizon that goes vertically upward so you can see some free outer space you can see some free outer space uh, outside of the event horizon now what stephen hawking said is that out of this black hole radiation will come that we know now think it like in most uh, near to the this event horizon and this is a vacuum and this is, uh, in our physical reality, this is simply a vacuum. There is nothing with it. But when quantum mechanics comes into the picture, this vacuum also gets some spatial properties. This vacuum is no longer simply a cheaper vacuum. You know, it's adds some much more uh, quality into it. So what happens is that uh, this is this vacuum is a one called quantum vacuum. There is no there is a quantum mechanics comes into the picture. So, uh, like uh, next slide. No. 
But in this quantum vacuum, it has some special property. And what Stephen Hawking is suggested that this black hole has the enormous gravitational attraction that it can tear apart this uh, vacuum and can make virtual particles out of that vacuum. Think about this vacuum. This it is completely a vacuum, but it has some quantum properties. And what Stephen Hawking suggested is that this the gravitational attraction of the black hole can tear apart this vacuum and can make virtual particles which were uh, previously if you think about uh, this space of the vacuums this uh, gravitational attraction this tear apart this vacuum and can produce two virtual particles that were uh, previously sitting here close to together so you can have a particle uh, let's say alice another particle let's say bob so alice is going to fall inside the black hole whereas bob is going is staying outside of the black hole now, now, what is the special property of the black hole? As these two particles is completely made out of nothing, out of empty space, and the space have no charge, no spin, no energy. So it is very essential that the particles that you made out of this uh, space uh, obviously uh, have some opposite properties. Like if Alice have, is a Bob has some positive amount of energy, the Alice must have some negative amount of energy. If Bob is spinning uh, clockwise, the Alice will spin counterclockwise. If Bob has some positive amount of energy, it will have some negative amount of energy. And this is very evident. And any particle, let's say any particle, let's say Bob, that escapes from this singularity to the outside world have some positive amount of energy. So Alice that is going inside the black will have some negative amount of energy. And that's what you see in this Hawking radiation that is evaporating. And that's, and that's why the black hole eventually shrink and lost their masses. Because inside the black hole, you can see there, inside this black hole, you can see there is a constant drizzle of negative energy particles that decreasing the mass of the black hole because you know Alice is a negative Alice has some negative energy and it is going inside the black hole so this negative drizzle of negative energy negative energy particles will decrease the mass of the black hole and this will essentially create uh, and this Hawking radiation will essentially create these two type of particles uh, Bob and Alice now empty space separated into sets of particles um, and this will necessarily give you particles that are always entangled with each other. However, this is not going to uh, the main context of our talk. We want more information. That's our main deal. By which we can know the first initial stage of the black hole. So once the black hole has evaporated, we want to know exactly what it was made of it. And we know that uh, like you have two particles entangled with each other and there will be more and more particles, there will be more and more uh, person like Bob's particle likes Bob, there are more particles like Alice and that will come out of the um, surface of the black hole to the outside world and we expect that that particle should give us some information. So yeah, physicists come uh, with, with the support of this statement, physicists tried also. So what they tried? like. When Bob leaves, when Bob leaves, the Bob is entangled, the Bob is previously entangled with the Alice, but the, when Bob leaves the surface of this uh, black hole, we don't get to know how Bob was entangled with Alice. So there is some lack of information within the Bob itself. So the thing is not going to be correct at all. But if we, if we believe this black hole to be evaporated and at the same time uh, the information to be conserved then we can we can see later many other particles are named uh, there you can name some uh, particle let's say um, john or let's say some uh, david so like, let's say john is uh, john is some uh, particle that is going outside and dave is some particle that is going inside so what you can see is that in support of this information, this statement, uh, Bob will essentially get entangled with John. But Bob was previously entangled with Alice. But when uh, the later radiation comes, like this John, the Bob will be entangled with the John. But but Bob will not be entangled with the 
what to call the name um anyway just take a name because the the counter atomic particle subatomic particle of the john there is no relation with the bob but in this way we can get some information but quantum mechanics says this doesn't happen this is not the tz that bob will entangle with the quanta once the bob is entangled with alice there will be no way for the bob to be entangled a little bit with any other particle so now despite of all the logical possibility of how information is lost we could like to see how information is lost where it goes and or it is destroyed but till now believe till now nobody has come up with a construct theory that can give you the consistent framework about the information so naturally there is several possibility of what happened to the information the first possibility information may be lost that you already discussed that bob has no way to entangle with the uh, john so it is uh, and bob already has lost some information so it is very obvious that bob has bob uh, the uh, through the hawking radiation he already lost some information hawking radiation is not going to give us the information of the initial stage of the black holes but this we we should not let this to happen because if this happens all the laws of quantum mechanics that you now see to be true will essentially break down okay so that's a for but so that's why still it is uh, not confirmed the second possible solution that uh, physicists suggest is the locality principle principle of locality uh, it's like the idea that uh, that happen in the like if you if you think in, in the space the universe uh, the principle of locality doesn't say that like like there is a particle in the space and this particle got suddenly disappeared and suddenly reappeared in this space locality principle is doesn't say this the locality the principle of locality is is saying that nothing can be happened so randomly this particle cannot be pop out of its existence and can uh, appear here not suddenly it will of course of course follow some path follow some rule of particle physics uh and then will reach to this point only then it will uh, happen and this particle will essentially uh, follow the quantum field theory here but uh, like you can see is a very beautiful example that if you uh, throw a pebble to a pond you can see that this ripples will gradually go, goes far away from this center it's not like that that the ripples is at first here and then suddenly it appears here it's not going to like that this is a, a beautiful example of the of the principle of locality that everything is going to happen step by step first at this particle uh, this ripple then this ripple then one after another another so this is the principle of locality it will follow some defined uh, defined rule defined path each and every point the information is very very stored and defined but the thing is that bob might not follow bob might not follow these uh, rules we don't know what is bob going to do bob may not follow those uh, rules of quantum field theory so if in the in the case bob doesn't follow the rules of quantum field theory then this is one of the the most beautiful theory in the physics will also going to be wrong so that is also a very very um warning for us now the third possibility is that maybe the event horizon is not empty what does this this mean uh this means is that that when all is alice could fall into the black hole and never notice anything is not uh, going to be like that that uh, ali simply going into the black hole and simply going entered into the black hole it's not like that this theory is saying that no it's not going to happen in that way instead there is a temperature is a high energy radiation that ali see when she gets into the black hole the hawking radiation on the other hand the hawking radiation then comes out of the black hole it's very very faint very very low wavelength so photon uh, out uh, from there is a very has some low energy but if you trace it back in the time when it was there you can see it has some very very high energy now you can see, you can say oh well it was invisible because it was um, part of quantum vacuum 
that was but this idea is essentially saying you that no this is not it was just there as a high energy particle as it was but it was carried by the wall of fire this is a new concept uh, just to solve the black hole information paradox the wall of fire that that whenever you enter into the black hole there will be a wall of fire and a, and this is true then then there would be and if this concept is really stands true and hold its um, uh, hold its demand as very solid then there is nothing inside the black hole but everything inside within the within the hurry event horizon all the stuff that we um, think made of the black hole would simply lie in the event horizon so these are the kind of possibilities that is uh, that can happen to the information so still nothing is sure we don't know whether in, in, the information is lost or conserved because i showed you the example that um, if this is lost then it will strike the rules of quantum mechanics but even if it this is uh, to make it conserved we have to be entangled multiple times for a single particle which is not also possible once the particle entangled with an other particle it it will have no chance to be entangled with another particle to so even for the little bit the second uh, possibility we told about that the principle of locality that nothing can be uh, appear or disappear suddenly everything will have uh, some path some some definite rule but we are not sure what the particle emitted by the black hole is going to follow because we are not sure that bob will follow or not follow uh, the rules of quantum field theory so this is also uh, not sure and the third is that the concept of firewall and if this firewall exist then there will be nothing inside the black hole and so the ultimate thing is that still now thousands of papers that is coming out each and every year just trying to solve this mystery this paradox but still it is one of the greatest mystery of the physics we don't even come to any conclusion till now and it's not like that all some uh, some few scientists are only working with that around the world thousands of scientists uh, are working to solve this puzzle even i know that uh, some uh, group of professors from icts bangalore are currently working uh, on that some professors from the tif are working on this puzzle but anyway all the brilliant minds throughout the world are currently doing work for this puzzle but still it is unsolved because this is not going to be so straightforward so simple what's exciting about this paradox is that all of the potential led to the new physics if for the first possibility holds true then it will break the quantum mechanics if the second possibility holds true then it will break the quantum field theory if the third possibility holds true that will break the ideas that we get from the general theory of relativity about the black holes so all these answers will lead to the new physics and i hope in coming days we'll get some more matter, more uh, significant ideas so no matter what we what if we resolve the paradox and it will break down some theories we'll do so by learning something new about the universe you know when there is there at the time of the newtonian physics only there there was only classical mechanics but when the quantum mechanics came the quantum mechanics was appeared to be very weird in terms of the classical mechanics but it ultimately by the time it proves that it is true maybe it have some uh, battle with the classical mechanics but yes it is true in its own perspective so no matter after the maybe after the years after the decades if we solve the paradox eventually we will learn something new about the universe and that's ultimately what matter in science truth is true and that's all so this is all about today's talk and this is all the information that i have got i don't know to how much extent i can convince this to all of you i'm just a second year student and still far from the black hole so this is all about today thank you and i really thanks to the organizers for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to give my to share my knowledge with all of you guys and the soul all the best good evening
Yeah, wonderful talk, Sayantan. I think uh, you have gone through, um, I think, more literature and then come up with these ideas. Um, so I wonder, um, have you aware of the black hole uh, image which was uh, uh, taken by the Event Horizon Telescope? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Just, that was uh, recently published some years back. Yeah, yeah, recently, last year only. Last year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, can you comment on that? Maybe I'll I'll, I'll share that image. I I just uh, let me share that. I have it. Yeah, so the screen is visible, right? Yes, yes, yes. The screen. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this is the, the data of the black hole. Um, yeah, it was on the news. So this is the event origin I think you are talking about, right? But but you cannot see in, at the center of the, the black hole. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, so this, 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 this data is some has been accelerated accretion disk outside of the black hole that you can see. Uh, it is not accre yeah, yeah, as I yeah. essentially accretion of the material only, but I think mm -hmm. at the boundary, um, yeah, yeah. somewhere here, this is the event horizon. But you mentioned, right, the space time will tear up and then it actually appears as the Hawking radiation. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I was uh, kind of, I, I was also new to the black hole uh, related science. Uh, can you uh, uh, explain a little bit more on that, how it actually happens? And then you took the examples of us two people, Alice and then Bob, right? So that part actually I, I could not understand. Uh, so can you uh, elaborate uh, on that? Actually, uh, what Stephen Hawking said is that uh, the what a vacuum we can see uh, in our physical reality is just simply a vacuum. But when we apply quantum mechanics to that vacuum, that vacuum has got some special features that we can manipulate some things using this vacuum. And that is uh, the black hole with this strong gravitational force can tear up this vacuum and can produce two virtual particles which will gain their uh, identity after that. Like um, from the vacuum, we can uh, like sir, uh, like matter antimatter, and when mm -hmm. they both to collide, they an annihilated and that will produce energy. So as this these two particles uh, are essentially produced from the nothing, like they mm -hmm. only from the vacuum. So just to hold the uh, energy to be conserved, this will have some counter properties. Like uh, if we have some particle as a positive energy, uh, some has a negative energies, uh, like a clockwise spin. So some other have a counterclockwise spin. So, so essentially, ultimately, the whole thing is that if we uh, made up together, it will essentially give us some vacuum. Okay. okay. So. Yeah, you took the examples of the event which actually happened in Calcutta, right? I think uh, Jain Nonlikar, when I was a PhD student at Aries, I think uh, I just were, I was like taking coursework at the time. So we had wow. a chance to listen to his talk. I think he gave that example. So I suddenly recall that. Uh, <laughs> okay, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, I, I just uh, gone through his books, one of the books. Uh, on black yeah, books, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I found He's that. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice. I, I could recall some of the things. And it's very really nice that even uh, we can't, um, <clears throat> you know, um, tell exactly what is happening. But at least we can have some thought on that, right? We discuss yeah, yeah. something and then, you know, yeah. we go and then think about it. So uh, yes, I think sir. that's the main initiative of this uh, uh, mm -hmm. talk series. I, I really liked it. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very, very nice. Nice try. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Sainthan, uh, there's a question in the chat box asked by Priyanshu Raj that uh, does black hole evaporate fully engulfing all the information or just retains its original mass? Uh, he has added that by original mass, he means that the bare minimum if there is any such thing. Uh, look, um, if you like, let's say, suppose there is a black hole in space. Now, by the time the more mass gets into the black hole, the black hole is essentially um, 
have some more masses, but at the same time, it will also get evaporated. And what is the special feature about this evaporation is that when the Hawking radiation comes out of the black hole, it will essentially decrease the uh, mass of the black hole. So by the end, by the time, like it will be a very, very long time. And there is some calculation I didn't remember, like 0.00001% uh, will only be lost after uh, trillions of years. So it will might take some long, long years to completely burn out the black hole. But yes, uh, after years, it will, according to that theory, Hawking radiation, it will completely burn up the, the total black holes. And what will end up is only some radiation, some photons. And that's it. And is there in, any other thing that the Friyanshu want to ask? Yeah, if someone wants to uh, want, uh, need more clarification, they can surely uh, unmute and ask. Uh, hello, uh, Sayantan. Hi, Prince. Yeah. Yes, hello. So, what I asked is that if the mass added uh, on the in the black hole uh, increases by the addition of some additional mass, so does the radiation evaporate it uh, fully or it just retains it the original one? Is what uh, I was sorry, asking. Sorry, can you explain it more elaborately? I didn't get exactly what you. Were I asked that if the a certain amount of uh, mass or any kind of information is uh, engulfed in the uh, black hole, mm -hmm. it increases its mass and then it radiates in form of uh, uh, Hawking radiations. So mm -hmm. does it uh, evaporate it uh, fully or just retains it originally? No, the radiation uh, coming out from the black hole has is very unique. It depends on the inter mass of the black hole. The amount of radiation that will come out of the black hole depends on the inter mass of the black hole. Mm -hmm. If it, it doesn't depend on the mass that you are going to throw inside the black hole, it depends on the inter mass of the black hole. Like if I mentioned that if you have a bigger black hole, you will see the Hawking radiation to be much more red. If you have a, a small black hole, it will be much more hotter, but you, you, you will see a radiation of a blue. So it will depend on the inter mass of the black hole, I think. Is it clear? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, that's good for now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if uh, there are any more doubts, you can ask or otherwise we can end the session. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Isharia sir. Uh, thanks, Ayantan, for the uh, both of Thank you the, everyone for nice um, managing uh, uh, your from your busy schedule uh, to attend this talk. I'm really grateful to all of you, especially Sir. Uh, so I waited uh, till the last moment, and I'm really grateful to say. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's all like everybody enjoyed it, and uh, really happy to be part of it. And I think we hope uh, we we are going to have much more exciting talks ahead. Uh, so we'll continue this. Uh, I think. Uh, a talk series yes, and also sir. i think i have some idea that um, uh, whenever this astro uh, physics day or uh, you know international astronomical day comes and uh, i think we uh, we we can actually explore a, a, a chance to visit any schools nearby and then maybe talk to these uh, the students and then yes, present some you know some interesting things or at least on the occasion yeah. of uh, uh, solar eclipse we can actually yes, sir, yeah. uh, take some uh, telescope and then you know uh, mm -hmm. explain what what actually how it actually happens and something like so we can actually um, see it some kind of interesting uh, interesting aspects uh, to the uh, into the ink minds so that yes, we, sir, we can initiate slowly um, uh, yes sir actually that would really be great because uh, many uh, mm -hmm. i being a student i can relate that uh, since childhood mm -hmm. many people are uh, like uh, fascinated yeah. by the, such topics That's but, true. Uh, but sir till now we are all praying to go to yeah. campus that's all <laughs> yeah 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 that's, i also missing that we also. already passed one left one year in our beautiful journey